So I think it's time for another live coding session. And just for a change, I'm going to be writing an assembler. I do do things that aren't assemblers on it. It's just that assemblers are simple self-contained tasks that work well on camera. So the context is that not long ago, somebody submitted very kindly most of a PDP-11 backend for Calgol, my programming language. This is still a work in progress, but I have been integrating it into the Calgol toolchain. And one of the things that you have to have along with a compiler backend is a assembler and linker to turn the resulting assembler source into something that you can actually run. Now I've been looking at the standard PDP 11 tools for this, which is macro 11 for the assembler. And uh, I think it's a tool called plink for the linker, but they are kind of overkill for what we want for Calgol. And I think that it would be cool to write my own simplified assembler for the PDP 11. Calgol doesn't need a full-scale linker. Uh, it generates a single assembler output file and expects this to turn into a binary that you can actually execute. So uh, by writing our own assembler, we can do without the dependencies on two different external tools. This is also interesting because the PDP-11 is somewhat more complex than the 8080, which is what I currently have an assembler for. So by writing an assembler for the PDP-11, I then get uh, to figure out how to do CISC architectures in my assembler framework. So some background. The PDP-11 is a very old architecture dating back from the 1970s. It's a 16-bit system which uses uh, byte addressed memory. So it's not actually that different from many other 16 bit systems like the, uh, the 8088 or the MSP430. However, it's got a very good reputation for being orthogonally designed. The instructions are very regular, even though it's a CISC system. And uh, it's still got a following today because it's apparently extremely nice to write code for. Now, I've never actually done this, so it will be very interesting to learn about. It is one of the most influential computer architectures of all time, so supporting it would be a really nice thing to have. So the way it works is every instruction, and let me find my notes document. Every instruction is a 16-bit word, which may be followed by up to two more 16-bit words, which contain the parameters. Now, uh, this is in hexadecimal, but traditionally the PDP-11 does everything in octal, which I'm not particularly good at. So I believe that's five six digits per word, so that, so valid instructions will either look like this, like this, or like this. How many extension words there are depends on the addressing modes of the instructions encoded into the first word. Now this is what makes it rather different from the architecture I currently have an assembler for, which is the 8080. On the 8080, every instruction maps onto a single opcode. I can't remember the numbers, but let's just say it's these. And every instruction, you know from the opcode what parameters it's going to take. So you know that MVI is always going to take uh, a register followed by a parameter. LXI is always going to take a register followed by a 16-bit parameter. 
Uh, ADC is always followed by a register. Uh, let me pick C, for example. So you know, um, so you know up front at the time you read the instruction from the assembler source file what parameters you're going to be expecting and also what byte you need to omit. This, actually, this makes assembling it pretty straightforward because you can just work from left to right. Now the PDP-11, because it uses multiple addressing modes and extension words, is a bit more complicated. For example, if you have this instruction, this will be a single uh, output word. This instruction is going to be an instruction word plus a extension word. This instruction is going to be a uh, instruction word followed by two extension words. How many extension words to expect is encoded into the, uh, the bottom four digits of the instruction word so that you can't when you're assembling it, you don't know what instruction word to omit until after you've read the two parameters. This makes assembling it rather more complicated. So I have taken a copy of the 8088 assembler, which is here, uh, and set up the builds. So as with last time, it's doing auto builds over here. So if you save the file, you can see uh, Calgol recompile it. Uh, I'm now generating x86 assembly rather than, sorry, x86 binaries rather than 88 binaries just for simplicity. I can then run it using, uh, that was not supposed to happen. Let me just make a, let's just see if it's just a simple write. That is definitely not supposed to happen. Let me figure out what's going on there and get back to you. Okay, that was a little bit clumsy on my part. I was in fact using the 64-bit toolchain to uh, assemble and link the binary rather than the 32-bit toolchain resulting in garbage binaries. Anyway, uh, I have the build system set up, so if I save the file, it rebuilds, and I get something I can run. Uh, I have a source file, which I can write uh, PDP-11 machine code uh, assembly into. I can then try running it with the assembler. This, of course, won't work because it's expecting 8080 assembler. And for verification, I also have a PDP-11 disassembler so that I can then disassemble the result and see whether it looks valid or not. And I also have here a disassembly of the original PDP-11 assembler. Unfortunately, I don't have the source code for it, but this gives me a wide array of test instructions that I can try. Unfortunately, I don't have everything set up yet for a end-to-end -end simulation test like I did with uh, the 8080 assembler. That should come later. So this is all going to have to be bench tested, but I should have enough here to actually, you know, try it. So here in the disassembly, you can see uh, this is the address in octal, instruction word, first extension word. You can see that this jump instruction takes a single parameter, which is encoded into the extension word here. You notice that these values are different. 
I'll get on to that later. It's using relative addressing modes. Let me see if I can find a absolute instruction. Here we go. Here's a two opcode sub instruction. This is subtracting this constant value, which you can see encoded into the first extension word, from the value at this address, which is encoded into the second extension word. And that is opcode 16. If I go over here to the handy table in Wikipedia, uh, where's the set of opcodes? Uh, 16 is indeed sub. Um, we've got 27 for the, I believe that's the source, yes, which is 27, which is immediate, uh, although that there is in fact, this is in fact done using some cleverness I will get to later. Uh, and the second one is 67, which is relative. So this is, this first value is an immediate operand and this second value is a relative addressed operand. So how are we going to start? Well, let's go to the assembler and start ripping out the 8080 stuff. Uh, we have, here we have the big table of opcodes, which I'm going to have to copy from Wikipedia. So let's just remove uh, all of these except for the meta operations. Uh, let me just remind myself. Oh, yes. And we also have. Uh, we need values for the registers as well. Uh, the PDP-11 has eight registers numbered from zero to seven. Uh, register seven is the program counter and register six is the stack pointer. So in fact, let's just stick those in now. Just like on the 8080, we're just going to implement these as uh, labels which resolve to numbers. Very, very simple. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And we want aliases for stack pointer and program counter. Okay, now the PDP-11 actually has, uh, where have we got instructions? A few different types of instruction. We've got double operand instructions, like this sub here. Single operand instructions, like... Uh, uh, yeah, JSR, we've got one right here which takes a single um, that's not working quite how I expect. Let me see. Oh, oh, zero, zero. Yeah, zero, zero, four, five, six, seven. So Ah, right. Uh, this is using a four byte opcode and the bottom octal digit specifies the link register. The, so that's 0045, that's using five as the link register. I will talk about that later. Uh, and six, seven is the addressing mode of the single parameter which is relative, it's the same addressing mode that we were using for here, it's, it's a relative address. Uh, in 
fact, JSR, EMT, etc. are specials. That was not a very good example. Clear is a better one. There should be a clear. There's a clear. It's uh, four digits of opcode, 0050, followed by two digits of addressing mode, and that can take one uh, extension word. So uh, we've got these. We've got the special forms for JSR and EMT. We've got conditional instructions which are encoded quite differently. They take a 8-bit offset in the bottom of the instruction. This allows you to do small branches uh, without needing an extension word. Um, and you have the others, including condition code registers, etc. I will have to look into these in more detail. I actually thought there was a full list in Wikipedia, but it looks like there isn't. So I'm going to have to look those up. Now the way we're going to implement these is our symbol table here has got a field for the callback, which tells the assembler what it is you actually want to do with the instruction, and a field for the opcode. This is a 16-bit field. We're only using 8 bits for the 8080. So let's go with a, just for demonstration, let's try a double operand instruction. MOV is really useful. So MOV, the opcode is octal 010000. The bottom two, the bottom four digits will be filled in by the callback. And this is going to be a double operand instruction. So this callback is actually going to be used by all instructions that follow this form. It will read in the two parameters, patch the addressing modes into the mov in, into the opcode, and uh, omit it. So here is mov b. So we should be able to use the same callback for all double operand instructions. And likewise, we are going to do the same thing for the single operand instructions. So here we've got clear. Clear is 0050, followed by two digits, like this. So we are now going to have to implement these. Now, of course, this won't assemble, uh, compile rather, because we haven't implemented these things. But let's take out the 8080 stuff first. Now, we do need to maintain the symbols for the special instructions. So we've got the operators used by the instruction evaluation. We've got the special forms used for emitting uh, constants. EQ, else, and if this is a register, this is a register. These are all simple instructions. That's a register. Edxi is special. Mod is an operator. Not is an operator. Org is special, PSW is a register, uh, these are operators, Oops, that's a register, title is special, like so, and uh, here we have the actual implementations, they should be in a sensible order, 
Okay, EQ set end if else if db ds dw rp. What is rp? I can't remember what that is. That wants. Well, we seem to have cut it out, therefore it's not going to be useful. Org. Okay, and here we have the callbacks for the actual instructions. And we're going to want to remove these, but I might want to just comment them out for now so I can refer to them later. It's been a while since I've worked on the assembler, so... Uh, What the trying to remember what the comment instruction is. Yeah, let's move this up. Next, if and friends where it belongs. Right. Uh, got op one and op two. So this is going to expect a single operand and then it's going to do something. This, however, is going to expect two operands separated with a comma. Yeah, the way I worked this with the 8080 is that when you read the expression, it returns the terminator. So I'm going to have to ch make expect operand do the same thing. So expect operand will read an operand, and then if you don't get the end of instruction, it produces an error. Read operand will read an operand and return the terminating token. So in this case, it has to be a comma. So this will read two operands and do something. And of course, we don't have expect operand. Now, uh, up here should be, yep, here's the expression reader. Here is indeed expect expression and bad separator. So we're going to have a read operand, which is going to return a token. Do I have a type for a token? I do. And we have expect operand, which returns a token. Which is straightforward, expected a single operand. Uh, 806 expect requires output. Right, this does not actually return the token. Right, and that assembles. The tricky part is going to be reading the operand. The operand actually is going to need to return both the addressing mode and whatever value needs to go into the extension word. So, where are our addressing modes? 
The PDP-11 has eight addressing modes, plus some extra addressing modes that are really syntactic sugar around these addressing modes. Your eight addressing modes are work on a register, work on the value pointed to by a register, work on the value pointed to by the register with a post increment, work on the value pointed to by the address pointed to by a register. So it in fact dereferences the register and then it dereferences the memory location in the register. Uh, this is useful if you are working on pointers stored in memory. And this has uh, a post increment form. We have the same for pre decrement. We have an indexed form where the uh, where you take the value in the register, you add on a constant, and the result is the address of the operand. And you have the double dereferencing version where the result of the addition expression is an address in memory. Now the extra addressing modes work by using the program counter or the stack pointer with one of these. And I will demonstrate how that works. So we have, we load a value into a, we load an immediate value into a register. That is actually encoded as more or less. But the instruction that you get in memory is this. The, with this form, the, when the instruction is executed, the instruction word itself is read and then the program counter advances to the instruction afterwards. Then the parameter is evaluated. This is the post decrement form referring to PC. So that reads the value at PC, which is one, two, three, four, and then advances the program counter. So that even though there is no actual explicit form that does this, you get the same effect by using one of the existing addressing modes. And the other addressing modes work in a similar way. Uh, we've got absolute addressing and relative addressing. These are uh, variants of uh, these two addressing modes here. From the point of view of our assembler, we're going to have to know how to read these and then generate the appropriate addressing mode and extension word. And this is where the work's going to happen. Uh, likewise, you also have similar syntactic sugar around pushes and pops. So what we're going to have to do is to figure out which one of these we're looking at. This is going to be moderately annoying, to be honest. We have an expression parser. This can read uh, any arithmetic expression that the assembler knows how to understand. Pro thing is, since registers are expressions, this is an expression. This is an expression. These both return a zero. This is also an expression that returns zero. So we're going to have to be a little bit clever about how we do this. For example, just reading an expression means that these two values will produce the same result. We can't tell the difference because this second value is just a parenthesized expression that's equivalent to, you know, 
this. You are allowed to do things like this, by the way. That gives R1. So we are going to have to look at the first character of the expression to see, is it a open parenthesis? Is it an at sign? Is it a minus sign? Is it a hash sign? And then disambiguate based on there. Now notice that we have this form. This is supposed to have values like, do values like this. But this first item is a number. So it is actually legal to do this. This allows you to have parenthesized expressions in the first form. So in terms of the things we have to be able to parse, if the if the first character is a open parenthesis, then it must be one of these, one of these, because the parameter at the beginning is parenthesized, uh, one of these. No, sorry, not one of these, because we know that the first character is a parenthesis, which won't apply for this. Uh, in fact, I think it is just those two. That's oh, yes, and one of these. So the algorithm we're going to have to use here is look at the first character. If it is a parenthesis, then read it. Then look at the next character. If it's another parenthesis, read that. Hmm. Uh, we can't actually tell the difference between one of these and one of these doing that. That's a bit irritating. We could consume the leading parenthesis yeah, we can consume the leading parenthesis, read the expression. That will go up to here. Uh, I think that doesn't help. So this addressing mode, this addressing mode only exists as indexed based on PC. Uh, this is used a lot, uh, so it's important that we get that right. Because our registers are just symbols, we can't identify, we don't know the difference between a simple arithmetic value or a register. I wonder if we're going to have to change that somehow. It, it's entirely possible to just bodge it, that if the value that we read is 7 or below, then it must be a register. But you are, the, the PDP-11 uses a segmented architecture. 
if you look at our disassembly here, you can see that uh, the addresses start at zero. That is actually where they're loaded in memory. So if you try to jump to any of these, then you, the assembler can't tell the difference between an actual address and an arithmetic value. Uh, Macro 11, the stock assembler, uses percent signs rather than R's to identify registers which allow would allow us to distinguish between them at assembly time. The other thing we can do is to change the characters used for indirection to something other than parentheses. Square bracket is a common choice. That way we can distinguish between grouping parentheses and actual indirection. But I'd rather like this to be as uh, standard as possible. You know, just looking to see if I've got any Macro 11 source code handy. I don't think I do. Is there anything in there? No, that's just the... There's no actual documentation for Macro 11 here. So I think I'm going actually going to have to I think I'm going to have to take the registers out of the symbol table. Uh, let me just take a quick look at the code generator to see what it produces for actual register values. Yeah, it produces R's. So that is what the author of the code generator expected. We can read, well, we, at past time we can distinguish between uh, registers and other things based on the callback. This requires us to peek the next token and check the callback. This means that you now cannot work on registers in expressions, but I think that's fair. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do that. Uh, now, where are our callbacks. We already have a yeah, end callback here is, a, is one of these. It doesn't actually do anything when you run it. So let's put here like so. Uh, in fact, when this will be executed if it sees one of these as the instruction parameter. So we can actually put a, this should never happen, so let's put a is going to want to be up here above read operand actually okay that works so when we read the operand we need to peak the next token if it is a register we know it's this form uh, this 
gets this form. If it's not a register, then we know it must be this form or something else. If you try to use a register in a expression, you'll get an error and we'll have to check that. Okay, let's look into writing some code. So we want to peek the next token. Hmm. Did I actually implement peek? <laughs> I hope so. I may have done this as a unget. Yeah. We've got push. No, that's a pushed character. Hmm. I did not implement peak. Right, let's implement peak. We're actually going to do this as a is not zero, then push token is not zero, then token is pushed token, push token is zero, and return. Okay. Uh, now, when you read a token, it will actually set a number of global variables to, to contain the things that the token points at. So you can only push a token immediately after reading another token. But that should be fine. Yeah, it does stuff like resolve the symbol. So where is our read operand? Okay, if at this point the token can be uh, it can be an open parenthesis, which means that we're looking at a expression or a parenthesized register. So at this point we want to look at the next token. If the token is a I have a value for token identifier. If it is an identifier and we're testing here to see if it's a register. Token symbol will be pointing at the Symbol, yep. Uh, 
If the token inside the parentheses is an identifier and it's a register, then this must be a parenthesized register. Otherwise, we need to read the expression. So we push the token back. We read the expression, which must be a expression, and then we need to read in Yes, and this must be followed by a closed parenthesis. Yeah. If read expression is not equal to a closed parenthesis, then uh, unbalanced parentheses. I think that has, a, yes, that has read and consumed that parenthesis. So at this point, we're good. So at this point, we have read this bit of an expression. We may next see another parenthesized register, or we might not see another parenthesized register. And this will depend on where this will make the difference between whether this is this form, an indexed register operation, or this form, which is a direct memory reference. So we need to read the next token. If the token is a open parenthesis, then we must be seeing a parenthesized register. So let's read the register we expect this value to be a register there are no other valid forms We now expect to see a close parenthesis. Oh, we do have an expect, good. So this, if we saw a open parenthesis there, then it must be indexed. Otherwise, it's a direct memory reference. Yikes. 
But life gets even more complicated because we also have these. Now we know that a training plus can only appear after a direct, after a parenthesized register. So that's here. So we can actually put the put the logic in here. So read the token. If the token is a plus, then otherwise undo the push. Compiles really nine two five nine nine five nine one. Yes, the code size has gone up. That compiles. I mean, it's not right, but it compiles. Okay, uh, right. What are our other choices? Well. We can have an optional at sign before any of this lot. After an at sign, we can have uh, parenthesize post increment, parenthesize pre increment, indexed, absolute relative, Uh, looking at these stack relative instructions, um, two six. Yeah, these these are actually just these. They sh they don't even need to be described. So we only have to care about these, and these. So in fact, you can have an at in front of anything except a plain register. Okay. Now, if the thing is a minus sign, then this can be either uh, actually, I was thinking that this can either be one of these or one of these. But a negative address doesn't actually make any sense. So I think we can assume it's always going to be one of these.
So let us expect a open parenthesis. Okay, uh, yeah, this is parsing for you. It was always a mess. It'd be so much easier with an actual parser generator. And believe it or not, I have one in Calgol, uh, ported to Calgol. It's Lemon. But uh, it's kind of overkill for an assembler, and integrating it will be more trouble than it's worth. So if it's a open parenthesis, read the thing if it's a register uh, I actually need to do that this is a parenthesized register which may be followed by a plus sign if it's not a register then this is wrong. If it's not a, yeah, if it's not a uh, register, then push it back read the expression and then look to see if it's indexed or a direct memory reference What else can we have? We can have a hash sign. This is pretty straightforward. We know the result must be a uh, constant value. Right, what have we got? haven't done simple registers. So we've read the token and it's not what we expected. It's not one of these rather. So it must, if it's a, if it is a register, then it's a register. I do not, yeah, if it's not a register, then it's got to be one of these. Uh, 
and you notice that there is no post incremental decrement form if you're using a uh, an index which is nice so read the expression Uh, the result must, uh, or it could be one of these. So if the result is a open parenthesis, yep, that's all as above. We could probably factor out into an, factor out a bit, but let's not worry about that for now. Oh dear. Uh, I think think we have them all now. I mean, there's no actual logic here. Let's try running it and seeing what happens. We've got two registers. Registers are not instructions. Right, that's because I haven't actually defined a add instruction. So that's turned into a label. And then let's try to execute this as the instruction. So what instructions do we actually have? Uh, mov. Simple register, that's what we expected. Let's try clur. Simple register, it is indeed what we expected. Good. That suggests that that is kind of almost working, sort of. Now we actually have to do something with the results. So we want to define some values for addressing modes and some variables to put the result of the read in. Traditionally, with this stuff, we're just using global variables. So, what have we got? It actually occurs to me that at rn is equivalent to this. That makes the addressing modes much more consistent. means that the bottom bit of the addressing mode indicates whether there's a additional dereference or not. So a simple register. Post increment. decrement index and a value that we or in to indicate that it's deferred and in fact we're going to do all this in octal because we want the register to go in the bottom octal digit. So the values that we need to store for this are the addressing mode, if any. No, in fact, there will always be an addressing mode and the extension word, if any. There will always be an extension word. 
Right, they will only be an extension word if we're using one of the indexed addressing modes, which includes relative here, or we are using one of the synthetic immediate addressing modes, which actually produce a auto increment addressing mode with a data word that's not part of the instruction. So it's in fact not going to be easy to detect whether we need an extension word from the uh, from the addressing mode alone. So let's use a third octal digit to express that, like this. OK. So this means here, when we expect a register, this is this is a always going to be pre-decrement with a register. That's going to be pre-dec ord with token symbol dot value. Expression uh, was given 16, especially when uint 8 was expected. Okay. And no extension word. We have a we have a immediate This is always going to be And the program counter is always going to be register seven. Ah, and where does uh, where does read expression put the results? Token number, token number. Uh, post ink. Okay. So post increment register, we have no extension word, post ink. Read token here will overwrite the value, therefore we need to save the register. So reg is token symbol dot value as range eight. Like so. In this case, a simple parenthesized register is going to be Ink. This is this. Yep. Register deferred. Index form. Right, ah, we have an expression, that's a value. Which 
we need to save because the next time we actually read anything then it will be overwritten. Uh, token number. This is indexed. That's going to be one of these. Direct memory reference. Right. Now, this is going to be a little bit complicated because direct memory references are, should actually be assembled as relative offsets from the current program counter. And the current program counter is, of course, not where we currently are. The current program counter is the address of the extension word that the offset is going to be stored in. So the way this is going to work is something like this. We have the instruction, we have the first operand, and here we're going to have PC minus label. Of course, when this instruction is executed, then that's actually going to look like this, followed by a data word. So, but when this is read, PC will be pointing here. And at, the, at this point, the point to where we are actually parsing the operand, we do not know whether it's the first or second extension word. Therefore, we don't know how much... Well, at the point where we read the operand, the program count is actually pointing here because we haven't omitted anything yet. So we're going to have to put in a offset of either two or four bytes, depending on whether it's the first or second uh, extension word. But we don't know which one this is yet. So that's actually going to have to happen later. Now, one way around this is to simply not generate position independent code. And instead of emitting a relative emitting one of these, sorry, it should be like one of these, then we emit one of these, what am I doing? Like that. This will look exactly the same, except that here we actually put the address of the label. It will work in exactly the same way, but take a bit longer because there's this extra dereference needs to happen. But I think I would rather not. Now, uh, how many spare bits do we have here? Uh, I'm trying to remember what 255 is in octal. 377 377 right we've got one more so what we're actually going to do is to set this bit that tells the actual instruction callback the things that's emitting the uh, the results that this value is a relative thing and needs to be adjusted for the, oops, uh, the program counter. So where were we? Direct memory reference. Hang on a second. needs to go there. So this is a 
relative extension post ink program counter do I have a we do have a program counter value program counter minus uh, value minus program counter okay it does occur to me that the PTP 11 is a segmented architecture where data and instructions are read from different address spaces I think I don't think this is something that the assembler has to worry about, to be honest. Or at least I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, what's this one? Simple register, that should be straightforward. Addressing mode equals AM reg or to conceivable. As you in date. Indexed form um, and this needs an extension This is a direct memory reference again. Right, well, 705, missing colon, 722, missing colon. You can tell I've been writing in C, C++, and Java recently. Right, well, we have a thing. What happens when you actually run this? It expected a single operand. Yep. Let's put that back to mov. separator interesting I know what's wrong yeah okay read operand here needs to return the next token so when we have a read expression or something like that then we already read the token when we have an expect we haven't so we need to put one of these in there Um, token is read token if it's a plus I think that's right. Bad separator. Why are we getting bad separator? So it should have passed through uh, here twice. Ah, oh, we need to read another token here. Right, good. That's worked. We have successfully assembled our first file. Except we haven't actually omitted anything. We just have read two operands. So what do we have? We have put some debug information. Xi sixteen. This should be the first operand. This should be the second operand. Uh,
Yep, that's correct. Uh, that has produced operands of 0, 1, which is register number 1. So if I change this to PC, you may notice a certain similarity to the arm here, where the program counter is an ordinary register, and you'll see more of that later. We, in fact, get what look like fairly sensible results. Let's try that. Uh, I might be in trouble. Now that seems to have worked. I'm just thinking that my syntax highlighting thinks this is a comment, but actually that is a comment in this syntax. So five seven should be five auto auto decrement deferred. Uh, five seven. Wait a minute, this is hex. <laughs> uh, I never did print octal. Oh dear. Five seven hex is uh, one two seven. So one means there's an extension word which is correct. Two seven is auto increment program counter, which is correct. Okay, we are getting somewhere. I think we're almost ready to actually start emitting stuff. So here we need to save the old the parameter one addressing mode. because the next expect operand is going to overwrite it. And at this point, we are now ready to start actually emitting the uh, opcode. So, so we use the opcode template that's stored in the symbol table. We now want the source addressing mode but just the bottom two bit digits of it. Shifted left by two octal digits, which is six bits. Followed by the destination parameter addressing mode. Now if we have a parameter one extension word emit it. If we have a parameter two extension word, emit it. Uh, var. U in sixteen. Okay, now we should have actually emitted something. Uh, what's our output file name? Output. Uh, 
Okay, we have something. So let us disassemble it and see what comes out. Mov. Two three two two comma R seven. Um, I think that's right. You know, one two three four, and de this is decimal. Uh, I just had a horrible thought. That am I going to have to change all my uh, immediate values into octal? I think if I want strict compatibility, I do need to. But I think that has actually worked. And let's try that. Missing expression. Oh, uh, I haven't done um, I haven't actually implemented this for one CB. That's easy enough. I haven't done any of the relative adjustments yet. That's still not going to work. But now I can debug why. Read operand. So you see that's gone through here. Right. I need to push the thing back onto. OK. And that has, now oh, that's interesting. So that actually emitted a immediate value, which is not what I expected. What that should have done was emitted a relative, an incorrect relative value. In fact, it is incorrect. That should be a, a octal 10, it is address 8. Yeah, this is my data word. So why has that produced the wrong result? Two, two seven. Wait a minute. Two seven is auto increment program counter. Ah, right. The disassembler is trying to be clever. It's actually read this relative value uh, yeah, oh, what it's done is it's decoded the synthetic addressing mode rather than showing me what's actually there. I wonder if there's a way to to stop that. Probably there isn't as it's not something anyone would really want. No. Okay, no matter. At least it's showing that I've got the right result. The fact, the fact that I've got the right result is a little bit concerning because that shouldn't be right because I haven't done any of the relative uh, adjustments yet. But it is at least showing that we're getting there. 
Normally, whenever you do a program counter relative addressing mode, the program counter is not quite where you expect it is because of processor pipelining. It looks like, in this case, the program counter is pointing at the beginning of this word rather than the beginning of this word. That suggests that it is only incremented uh, after the instruction is evaluated. No, wait a minute, that's rubbish. No, this this is the wrong addressing mode. This should be deferred. No, it shouldn't be deferred. Huh? Okay, let's take a look at this again. 27 is the right addressing mode. Relative should be 67 indexed. But relative is not hang on a second. So if you use one of these relative addressing modes, then it's actually the the index addressing mode which does not adjust the register. So New auxiliary PC for the next instruction. Right, this actually suggests that if the destination instruction is the program counter, then you always get uh, automatic incrementing even if you're not using the right addressing mode. That's unexpected. I don't see anything in here that explicitly says that, though. Immediate and absolute are merely auto increment and auto increment deferred applied to PC. Yeah, I think that's this bit here. It automatically increments it past the auxiliary word. Right. So this should be index rather than posting, and the same here. Let's try that and see what happens. And we should now get the wrong result. Yeah. Okay, let's try that. Uh, the relative stuff. So we need the addressing mode, which is a uint eight, and the extension word which is a uint 16. So if there is no extension word, give up. If the if it's a relative value, uh, 
program counter here is wrong, so let's remove those. Okay. That is an incorrect value. So probably We just need a adjustment there. That is now pointing at the right value. So let's just do something a bit later one. not right. Those should be pointing at different words. Emit 16 does adjust the program counter, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Hmm. Oh, wait, no, I'm looking at the wrong fields. Yes, this is correct. Move 6 to 10. This is at address 6, this is at address 10, both octal. It just so happens they're both encoded as the same value because uh, of the two offset. Uh, note that you are allowed to do this, although the result doesn't really make any sense. Let's just see what that does. Yep, that's correct. Good. Right, I, um, I think that works. Well, it's not exactly tested, but I can hope. Let's insert the other instructions. So we want the double operand instructions, which are these. The PDP-11 is way more orthogonal than the 8080, so there are in fact fewer things I need to hard code. bit, bit b, bic, bic b, bis, bis b, add sub. Bit, bit b, bic, bic b. Uh, bic and bis are the rough equivalents of uh, or and and. Bic is uh, and with an inverted value. Bis is or. This means that actually getting and is, you have to negate source. Uh, I'm, I've seen this before on other architectures. So 0, 03, 1, 3, 0, 4, 1, 4, 0, 5, 1, 5. Oh six one six. Um, right, these are some exceptions used for special instructions. 
These will probably need their own callbacks, so I won't fiddle with them for now. Includes uh, things like multiplication, which these got wedged in later as an extension, so they don't really fit the encoding scheme. But let's do these. So JSR and EMT, have I done s o o o three? Is that right? Yeah, I'm doing these in the wrong order. Okay, so let's just do a bunch of those. Uh, JSR and EMT are special, so I'm not going to touch them for now. It's still using one on the top bit to indicate that this is a byte-sized operand rather than a word-sized operand. Ink, ink, B, actually, I can be cleverer than this. Clear com complement this yeah this is the negation I was mentioning yes mentioning earlier ink deck neg adc sbc Test, test B, Rawby, Rollby, ASI, ASRB. Uh, these shift by one bit, but there are some extensions that allow. Um, shifting by multiple bits that got added later. The PDP-11 went through multiple versions of the architecture. Okay, and now we get to the... Oops, that should be... Mark. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... B air NTPS MFP oops MFPI FP FPD Yeah I'm getting tired and my typing is suffering TPI TPD Sign extend move from processor status. So one oh six seven oh six seven one oh six six oh six six one oh six five one oh six five one oh six four got myself muddled. Ah, uh, there's no ASRB, that's why. So 1063, 0063, 10... Uh, hang on, I've got ASR in twice, that's the problem. ASLB is 1063, 0063, 1062 I've got another two ASRs. I seem to have a lot of ASRs in there. Roll 
will be as 1061 over 061. 1060, 060, test B, 1057, 1057, 1056, 1056, EDCB, 1055, 0055, NEG B, 1054, 0054, Deck B one oh five three Ink B five two Com five one five O oh. and Swab is O oh, oh, three. Okay. Uh, notice that the ADC and SBC instructions don't do what you might expect from others from other architectures. Rather than being a two operator add plus carry these just do the carry adjustment for an earlier edition done with uh, the two operand add or sub these two right so the conditional branch instructions are special because they have the embedded offset and this is going to bring us to another interesting feature of this pro this architecture that this has in common with many other architectures so it's something the assembler is going to need to deal with but actually I think I'm going to do JSR and EMT first So JSR is 004 and let's just line these up nicely. anymore. Right, JSR. So you remember how I said that this was a little bit like ARM? The way JSR works is that you give it a register and you give it a label. And uh, let me actually just double check that I'm right about this. What it does is it pushes the value of the register onto the stack. And then later, you, when you return from your uh, subroutine, you use this, and it pops the value of the stack into this register. Now, if you're just using R3, this doesn't really mean much, but normally you use PC. So this pushes the old value of the program counter onto the stack and this pops the value on the stack into the program counter. Now, this does actually suggest that RTS is encoded as a simple MOV because you can just uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm completely wrong about that. It pushes the, yeah, I looked this up earlier, but I seem to have got it muddled. Uh, the old value of R4 will be pushed to the stack and the return address would be an R4. Ah, right. And if you use PC, it in fact does not, you not do this. Yeah, this is used for varag calls, 
where one of the parameters wants to be the stack address. So that yes, you would use R3. You would uh, hang on. What? The old value of R4 and the return address would be an R4. Oh yes, right. This is so that this is to allow you to access values immediately after the JSR. So that, for example, you could do. So that when the JSR is called, printS gets uh, R zero points at the string, which is immediately after the JSR statement. It can then increment R zero and then it finishes with ret R zero and this value goes back into the program counter. But if this is a PC, then this is a special form that doesn't do any of this. Okay, that's n not the way I thought it worked. But anyway, what we have to do here is read an operand. Well, in fact, the in fact, it works like this. And then we read the second operand. And this is in, yeah, there's, the second operand is the destination and it is encoded in exactly the same way as for an op1. But the register is is encoded in its instruction. Um, Yes, that four is part of the opcode and not part of the addressing mode. So if I go look at it, it's a it's an auto decrement. Yeah, that makes no sense as a addressing mode. Param one addressing mode not found. Initializer of wrong type. Ah. Implement symbol callback. Yeah. That was fiddlier than I was expecting. Okay, so let's put in PC comma data two. First parameter must be a register. First parameter is a register. It also occurs to me that I completely forgot to do this. So 
So we should go through. Oh, it's got the register in it. Yep. JSRCD. Uh, if addressing mode and 370, uh, that masks off the bottom digit, which has got the register in it. There we go. And we are calling the, the two here. That is the right value. Yes, and you notice that this has the disassembler here has emitted the PC. So we should probably allow that form in the assembler, but I'm not going to worry about it for now. And RTS is very similar. What is the... Hmm. Uh, the encoding for RTS is not in this table. Yep, okay, I'm going to have to go and find the real documentation. And I could probably get a T refill as well, so back in a moment. Okay, here's the 1979 PDF of the uh, processor handbook and the RTS instruction, which I just had a moment ago before I moved away from it. Here it is. Uh, has got the register in the bottom, three bits, and has got opcode to zero. So, so o to zero RTSCB. So this is going to be very nearly the same code, except only with one operand. Like so. Double check this. Ah, O O O two O. O O O two. There we go. Right, ret. Yes, RTS PC comes out as ret. Ah, and JSR PC comes out as call. Right, that's actually, I can implement those very easily. So let's actually just do that. So a simple CB instruction has got takes no parameters and it just emits that value. I have no call CB. So all we need is a simple operand like so. Let's call CB. And we have no simple CB, but we can put one in very easily. That simple. It 
JSR R3 go data two, call data two. JSR R332, JSR uh, that's the wrong operand again. There's seven there. For the program counter, there we go. Nope, did that wrong. That should be a zero there and a seven there. That's better. JSR PC turns into call. JSR R3 is a JSR R3. Call is a call. RTS PC is a RET. RTS R3 is an RTS R3. And a RET is a RET. Excellent. Right. So I am. Um, Let's look at the next group of instructions. Yes, conditional branch instructions. Right, now, because these instructions have a limited offset, if you try to branch further than can be represented in one of these instructions, then we either have to fail with an error or generate different machine code. Now, Calgol is a compiler, so it doesn't really know how big code is. It's not its job. Therefore, it really wants uh, the assembler to automatically expand any of these instructions. Now, the way this works is... Let's remove some of this nonsense. Say we have... How does this work? BNE... Uh, yeah, these these work based on the processor flag, so they only take one parameter. So normally we get this, which becomes something like that, where the 2, 3 is the encoding of the delta. If the delta is too big, then we have to ch change the code to produce this. So where this is a single 16-bit instruction, this is now three 16-bit instructions. We've got one for the BEQ. Um, I think that's going to be a four, followed by a jump. This means that instruction changes size depending on the code layout. We have a two-pass assembler, so that uh, this is to allow exactly this sort of thing. Uh, so we can make this work, but we're going to have to be really careful. It is possible to produce bad code by doing this wrong. Now, let me take a look at these instructions. Uh, BR is branch always. It's kind of special. I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore this one for now. I'll have to implement that specially. But all these other instructions are in pairs. Yeah, which are negated. Good. They're all just checking the logic is correct. This means that we can negate the instruction by flipping this bit, which is nice. That makes the implementation much easier. OK. Let's add them. Uh, 0004.
like so, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 entries. So we've got BNE, BQ, BGE, BLT, BGT, BLE, BPL, BMI, B high, B loss, BBC, BVS, BCC, BCS, B his. Below, and these last pair are just aliases for each other. And this is going to be four zero four zero four zero all the way down. Okay, so the reason why there are so many is we have uh, signed and unsigned comparisons. So these will all be unsigned. These check for non-negative or negative. Uh, these check, these do signed comparisons. Yeah, the, uh, I need to figure out the difference between B high and B his. Higher than, oh, higher or same, okay. Yeah, uh, Actually, looking at this, yeah, these instructions are signed. The XOR is a giveaway. Well, these ones are unsigned. And we have two uh, plain equality instructions. OK, let's go and implement concb. So we are a two-pass compiler. There's two, there's two ways of doing this, which is to be, be a two-pass compiler or a multi-pass compiler. A multi-pass compiler generates better code. A two-pass compiler is simpler. So we're actually going to do this in a two-pass way. The, the issue is that as your code changes size, your various labels might move in and out of range of short uh, encodings. And if you're not very careful, you can end up with a situation where the assembler will decide on one set of encodings, uh, move on to the next pass, decide on a different set of encodings, and either generate bad code or reach a situation where it can't actually uh, some of the labels have moved out of range again. And if you're not careful, you can end up with infinite loops where the compiler continuously rearranges the code and labels move in and out of scope and it just doesn't work. So for a simple two-pass compiler, what we have to do is do pass one based on every instruction taking the maximum possible size, which is three words, six bytes. And then in pass two, we shorten any instructions that can be made shorter. It's not as efficient as a multi-pass system because it's possible that uh, in pass two, now that the instructions are shorter, we'll be able to 
uh, encode some things using the short version, but it is simple. So, now the result is always going to be a label. So I don't think we want an operand. I think we want a expression. So we read the expression. If we are in pass one, then don't do anything except increase the program counter. If we're in pass two, then we actually emit the code. So let's figure out the delta. Token number, token number. And the offset is, let me check this. The low order byte is an offset relative to the current location. This offset is a number of words and it's signed. Okay. So, make sure that interpreted as signed. Uh, this can vary from minus 256 to 254. If it's within this range, then we can use the short form. And we want to do shift it right by one and truncate it. Okay. If it will not fit, then we need to change the sense of the instruction Use an offset of four, I believe. We'll have to check this. And then emit a simple jump. And, and our jump is, that's a single op instruction. Uh, Oh, I haven't implemented that yet. JSR. Oh, wait a minute. Jump is uh, jump is moving a value to PC, so it's just a mov. Let me check to make sure that is correct. Last generate the second word, control, blah, blah, blah. Opcode 0001DD. Oh, D, DD? Well, This is not a mov instruction. Uh, 
Um, hmm. I do wonder why it's not a jump interruption. Uh, not a mob interruption. Jump. So the DD at the bottom of this is the uh, addressing mode of the thing to jump to. I am surprised, but let's stick with what it says here. Just double check. This is all. The, this is all this has on jump. No actual useful information. Okay, so o o o one. Uh, because we want a immediate value, this is going to be fact it's going to be one of these relative extension am index by pc so index is 6 so that's 6 um, token number minus program counter plus two, I think. Uint 16 and Uint 8 are not compatible. Um, Uh, Calgol requires you to be completely explicit about conversions. So uh, when we do this shift, we actually want it to be an unsigned 16-bit value because that shifting those is cheaper than shifting signed values. And uh, the result has to be a 16-bit uh, value before it can be... Whoops, that should be an all. before we can or it in with the value. Right, well that compiles, so let's try. So BEQ data one, clear data two. Label already defined. I 
think I think I have a problem. So you get this error if you try to define a label to a value that it hasn't been defined to before. And this is happening because the first pass through the code, this is 6 bytes, and this is 2 bytes, thus giving this a value of 8. Sorry, this is 4 bytes, giving a value of 10. The second pass through the code, this is 2 bytes, this is 4 bytes, thus giving this a value of 6. That's what it's telling me here, 10 versus 6. Now that is actually legal Uh, ooh, no, that's not legal. Right, I am going to have to change my framework. This needs to be a three-pass compiler. So the thing is, the, the first pass through, we get these values. The second pass through, we get these values. But uh, if we refer to data one up here somewhere, then in the second pass, when we emit this, we're actually emitting the wrong value because it, it has the value defined in pass one when it's at 10. But it's not anymore, it's at six. Well, you only know it's six at the end of pass two. So we're actually going to need a third pass where the values are the same as at the end of pass two for actually emitting the code. Now we didn't need any of this with the 8080 because the 8080 didn't have instructions that change size. So we're gonna to have to change the framework. Uh, that should be easy enough, the framework's just this bit. So at the end of pass one, all value, all symbols should be defined. Then we do pass two to shrink the code. Then we do pass three to omit the code. So we only want to omit and pass three. We only want to print the title and pass one. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, this needs to be maximally expanded in pass one, but the right value in pass two and three. We only want to omit the listing in pass three. I only make the listing in pass three. I'm gonna have to fix the listing because I bet that's wrong as well. Okay. Now that's still not gonna work because we get the label already defined error. Now, I think that you are allowed to redefine labels in passes two and three. So if we're in pass one and the value of the label is changing and it's undefined, yes, that should work. And we get a invalid opcode, yay. We get several invalid opcodes. Oh, that's it. the first invalid opcode is this DW. The second one is the BEQ, which is just hopelessly wrong. So let's check here, what have we got?
Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so we now have the correct BNE. <laughs> Except that should be a BEQ. Okay. Did we get these right? BNE should be 1400. That's better. So BQ10, data one is at 10, it's here. Okay, so let's put lots of stuff here. Um, I think I need more stuff in there. Wait a minute. That's not done anything like what I expected. Yes, you be. Ooh. Uh, that's a that's a nasty bug. Okay, what DS does is it uh, just defines zeros in the output file. Uh, this is actually not emitting any code. Uh, it's just increasing the program counter. Uh, as this was copied from the 8080, then that's kind of the same problem. This will have worked fine if DS is at the end of the program. Okay, so this is going to need to be well, token number is zero loop and it's going to be zero. Okay, uh, I didn't insert enough stuff so we can still actually reach the instruction, but at least that's now doing the right thing. Uh, and <coughs> that's all wrong. It's using the wrong register and the wrong addressing mode. So, for a start, this offset here is wrong. It's off by four. Four, really? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, there's the offset is a number of words rather than a number of bytes, so it needs to be shifted right by one. That's better. So now this BNE is pointing at the right place, this clear instruction. The jump instruction is trying to get to 640. Is that the right address? No, it's off by four. I 
think I need a minus two there. So this is now jumping to six, three, four. Right, that's correct. So there's cond working. BR is similar. Uh, the difference is that there is no actual condition involved. Conditional involved. So the the largest value, the largest size it can be is four bytes. Uh, and if it doesn't fit, then we don't want to omit the the jump over. So it should just be that. So we have jump 632, which is the right address. While if it's shorter, it's a branch to 10, which is the right address. Good. Right, we have conditionals working. Uh, and actually, just before I do anything else. So that's cal as an arch eighty eighty DSCB. Let me just stick that in the eighty eighty assembler and delete that move that file. Okay. Right, well what else have we got? We've actually done the bulk of the instructions. We have some uh, salt, subtract one and branch. Oh yeah, right. These are the special one-op instructions. Require a register source operand. Yeah, so this is the same as a two op instruction, except the uh, the op code extends into the three bits of the source instruction, the source operand that normally represent the addressing mode. So you just have the uh, the, the register bits. Sob here is going to be quite special because it's another branch instruction. Okay, well, let's take a look at these. I think these are all the same. I may have to look these up in the real documentation. Uh, 070RSX. Yeah, these, these are actually instruction extensions. Unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be a nice table of uh, Oh, this is the floating point unit. There doesn't appear to be a nice table of instruction encodings, which is a shame. That's one reason why I wanted the Wikipedia article, because it looks simple. Div, divide instruction, 75. Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, ash and ash C. It is and the number of bits specified in the count field bits five to zero of the source operand. You're right. Uh, the source operand therefore is not a yeah, right. It's not an addressing mode. It's a constant. Yeah, okay. These are, these are kind of weird. Let's do mull and div. Verify they work. These seem to be similar, which is nice. This actually does seem to be the encoding table, but it'd be nice if it was a bit denser. All right, div, divide, 071. I think mole is 070. This is a two op um, two operand instruction. Did I actually implement expect register? I don't think I did. I didn't. Easy enough to fix. And of course, there's no extension word for the source there is an extension word for the destination yeah that should be it don't need anything else so mole r1 by data 1 div r2 by r3 Yeah, that's not right. Let's just get rid of this as well. In R1, R and RV1. Is divided by the source operand. The looking at the disassembly here, uh, the the order of the operands is source destination. So that looks like the destination is the thing on the left. So in fact, these need to be the other way round. So the encoding is inverted based on, uh, that's really not right, the encoding is, okay, div is correct, but the encoding is inverted relative to the other uh, instructions.
right. Because the source is the one that's got the extension word, we do need to copy it here. To extension word. And it's the second parameter that needs to be a register. Well, that's not right either. Seven seven oh seven. Okay, okay, that's better. Fourteen years with R one, R two, and R three. Okay. Good. All right, what's next? Ash and Ash C. Actually, I think these might be the same encoding. Let's just give that a try and see what happens. Which we'll have to rename the uh, have to rename the helper tool. Yep, that's fine. That works. Why is there an extension word? That's because this is not a constant. This is whatever's at the address in nine. So if you want a constant, we have to do this. Yep, okay. And remember that this is octal, so 11 here is eight plus one, which is nine. Right, let's rename this. Uh, oops. to C is seven three XOR is seven four that should be a two duplicate symbol during init XOR. Mm. This suggests that there's already a XOR. Oh, oh, blast. Uh, yeah, the instruction is conflicting with a operand. I assume that we're actually doing something with that operand is not just dead code. Push and apply operator. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I have to rename one of these. It's going to be this. That's a pain. Anyway, that does seem to be working. So we're at SOB now. I'm going to ignore floating point instructions until we have an application that needs it, because Calgold doesn't. System instructions I'm going to have to look up. Right, where's SOB? Because this is going to be weird. Subtract 1 and branch if not equal to 0. Okay, 077R00 plus 6 bit offset. Yeah, that's exactly what I expected actually. The offset goes in the bottom 2 bits. Uh, this is wrong. Uh, I'm so used to hexadecimal that they said two digits, and I immediately thought 256. But that's actually going to be plus or minus 64 words. That's 128. Is that right? And 64 words, 128 bytes. Yeah, yeah. That'll be 128, 126. That gets awed into the bottom two bits there. So uh, our sob instruction is actually going to be very similar to cond. Uh, sob is seven seven. We expect a register. Yeah, a simple expect register is not going to help there because we still need to deal with situations where it's the first or the second parameter. So let's just keep doing it longhand. Followed by an expression. And we want to save the... parameter one addressing mode. Now, sob's tricky. The way it works is it essentially does um, branch if not equal to zero, like this. So, in order to in order to expand this, that is, if dest is too big, then because we cannot invert the sense of this, we're actually going to have to do um. This. Yuck, yuck. So that's one, two, three, 
four words. Yeah, I don't think there's any other option there. Well, what happens if we do it longhand? So that would be deck R4. Uh, so sob is equivalent to this. I assume it's equivalent to this. Does Oh, sob doesn't change the condition codes. So uh, replacing it with something that does, like, la, yeah, like deck, means that in the long form it will corrupt the condition codes when we're not expecting it. The, uh, the Z80 suffers from the same problem with DJNZ. So no, I'm going to have to do this long form blast. Okay. So program to plus eight. Mm, let me fix this as well. Oh, seven, seven. It's two octal digits, not two hex digits. Uh, where are we? So we're actually going to jump forwards two bytes. I think that's actually, yeah, two bytes. The branch is going to jump forward four bytes. So this is the sob. This is the branch, which is 0004, 004, uh, two, I think. Then we get the jump to the destination. All right. Well, that delta is rubbish. Oh, oh, two. That should be correct, actually. That's not. Let me double check the docs. The offset is a six bit positive number. The sub instruction cannot be used to transfer control in the forward direction. Oh. Oh. You. Okay. That's not at all as I was expecting. That means this is a... Uh. Oh. Uh, also, I think these are numbers... I think this delta is still wrong. Yeah. So that's minus two, five, six, and delta is less than zero.
So this branch is backwards. Okay. Two times offset. So that's divided by one. Okay. Well, let's put some code in here. So that we can actually make it jump backwards. Right, that is actually doing the right thing. We cannot use sob to jump forwards, that means we can't use it here. This means this isn't going to work. What we have to do is t2 t1 jump test t2 sub r4 comma t1 Okay, that should work. Yeah, um, I'm slightly struggling to see how useful this is. So this is the branch. This is the jump. And then last, is the sob instruction which goes back for so what do we have br36 which goes to here which is the sob instruction sob 34 that's the wrong result this needs to be is it four. Really? I thought that would. It's a number of words. Actually, yeah, that should be a three because we're including the. Here we go. So up R4 to R32, which is here, which then jumps to 46, which is the 2. That's the correct result. Right, that is fairly loathsome. Uh, it's also possible for us to shrink that jump down, because if we're jumping forwards a small amount... So else if... So the branch, we, we lose one word. This now becomes a branch. Unexpected. 
So BR34, this is wrong. That wants to be a, that wants to be a, that wants to be a three. That wants to be a two. BR34 goes from here to here. Uh, if the sob is correct, it goes from here to here, and we do the BR to 46. But if you put lots of stuff in there, then we have BR from here to here, sob from here to here, jump to 666, which is a 2. Wow, okay, uh, yeah. Thinking about compiler generation, this means that we should only really generate a sob at the end of loops, so it jumps backwards. I am not sure whether Calgol's good at this, because the front-end compiler doesn't really know about the different... It doesn't know about what all the different loops are. Yeah. Okay, well, we haven't done EMT. Which is 104000 We're actually getting there. There's only a few classes to go, which is good because I have to be done in about an hour and a half. Right, the the bottom byte can be anything. <coughs> uh, so expect expression. Mid sixteen current instant value uh, if token number is greater is token number unsigned? Yes it is. Uh, Okay, that should be easy. So, what is fifty two in octal? Uh, I have my trusty HP 48 here, so let me just type 5 to uh, hash 5 to equal base to real is 42. Yeah, that's the right value. Good. Where are we now? Done all these, hopefully. Done all these. Not done not done jump yep not done jump yeah this is the one that I was wondering why it wasn't a mov to PC Uh, 
that's o o o o o four. Just because I'm curious, data to comma PC. That's produced garbage. Yeah, it's the wrong opcode. Yeah, so I think these both do the same thing. Interesting. Probably jump is faster. But anyway, five six RTI, that is the right value. Yep. So that's jump mark. What's mark? Use as part of the standard P2P11 subroutine return convention, mark facilitates the stack cleanup procedures involved in subroutine exit. Assembler format is mark n. Okay, that looks easy enough. Oh, six, four. This is very similar to emit CB, except with a different range. symbol during init mark. Okay, that's right. Mark 7 is just what I said. EMT trap and buppet. Presumably breakpoint. I have a feeling these will be Fairly simple. Uh, condition code instructions, we'll need to do those in a moment. What's this? That's a very poorly scanned picture of some PDP 11 users. All I can see are suits. Trap. Traps and EMTs are identical in operation, except they use different addresses. Okay, so where did we put EMT?
trap three, that works. Uh, BPT, breakpoint trap. That is a simple instruction. Uh, I also remember that halt was there too, so that's easy to do. Yep. And halt is this, okay, bpc halt, bpc halt, what's next, iot input output trap, yeah we're getting into the pretty woolly ones now. Uh, um, actually, these are zero, one, and five, so let's just stick those in. Zero, one, and five. So, IOT should be here somewhere is four I wonder what instruction two is RTI and RTT <laughs> RTI is instruction two. And RTT is six. Okay. Condition code operations. Uh, I think symbols SCC and CC assembly instructions set or cleared respectively all four condition codes. Um, yeah, I don't think Wikipedia is helping here, so here we go, set selected, set condition code bits, selectable combination of these bits when we set together, condition code bits corresponding to, so this actually looks interestingly complicated. Because you can set or reset any combination of the condition code flags. What it doesn't do is go into much information about the syntax. So, the base is 260, so out comes the HP 48. Uh, binary to real, that is 176. Let's try this and see what comes out. Uh, so the disassembler says they're just invalid opcodes. 
set the bit specified by z bit 0, 1, 2, or 3. So this looks like this disassembler only understands the instructions for setting single bits, and if you want to do anything else, you roll your own. That means it's pretty easy to implement. So we've got SCC set all, which is 000277. And then we've got SEC, which is 00261. V2. Z four C A N seven O and there'll also be the equivalent C instructions. should be here somewhere, here we go, which are exactly the same except they're based on 240 rather than 260. These are CL rather than such CCC, CLC. Okay, so let's put them in our test file. CCC, N, SCC, V, Z, CCC, CLN, CLC, CLV, CLZ. NCVZ, NCVZ, CCC, NCVZ, NCVZ. Okay. Well, I think I am probably done with most of the Wikipedia instructions. So let's go to here and scroll up to the top of the instruction list and just work through them. ADC, ADC, B, done, add, done, ash, ash, C, done, done, done. I'm doing this from memory. Professionalism, I've heard of it. Uh, BLT, BMI, BNE, blah, 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 BR, C, Com, we did do com, didn't we? Yep. CSM, call to supervisor mode. Um, copies the current stack point to the supervisor mode. And the argument word address is by the operands. That's the word. Well, it's a one op instruction. Oh seven oh one CB CSM six Well apparently that is not correct.
So that is a destination register. Ah, that means I can't use one of these, so let's just do one of those. That's still wrong. Maybe this disassembler doesn't support it. It does say it's only on the 1144. Oh well, I'll leave it in. Deck, div, emt, halt, inc, iot. Did I do iot? I did do iot. Jump. Yep. JSR. Ooh, LDUB. Cause of the lower eight bits of general register three to be loaded into the micro break register. If you say so. If that's supported. No. Yeah, I think this disassembler only supports more recent stuff. But let's just go put these in anyway. Uh, med maintenance examine dep. Processor specific maintenance function. First word is used in the escape of the code representing the operation and the address. Okay. Wow, there's a lot of it. Uh, MFPD, move from previous data space. We've done these, they're up here. MNS, maintenance normalization shift. This is a floating point instruction, therefore I will ignore it. MOV, MOV B, MPP, maintenance partial product. Used for diagnostic purposes to test the multiplication network. This looks floating point, so I'll ignore it. Done those, done those, done those, done those. Raw, RTI, RTS, RTT, that did do RTT, yes, it's there. Uh, SBC, all the S's, SOB, SPLs at the priority level. Right, this is another special. Oh, 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 two, three. And it takes a small expression. When it understands. Uh, sub, swab, suxt, suxt, trap, test, wait, XFC, user control store, utilizes the XFC instructions associated with the UCS option. Ugh, I'll just ignore that one. XOR, okay, well, that seems to be the lot. So that would be it done. How am I going to actually test this to any great degree? Well, we've got the disassembly of the... Oh, I haven't tested any of the, the at sign instructions. Let's put a couple of those in, see what happens. Plur data two. Okay, that worked. Um, I don't have any source code, I can use this 
disassembly of the uh, the PDP-11 assembler, but I would have to unoctal quite a lot of it. Ah, uh, yeah. Remember what I was saying about JSR when I got muddled earlier? This is doing exactly it. So this is calling the routine at 166. R5 is pointing at this piece of data here, which you can see is not data. So if we go up to 166, there's a routine here which does stuff and it eventually should end with a ret r5 rts r5 here we are uh yes yeah, so as, as i was saying i would need to unoctify some of this uh so i think i will just this looks like a likely piece Let's just do this. Chop out this. Those are semicolons, so we can leave them. And registers are not instructions. At line 13, comp. Oh. How did I miss comp? Did I do test as well? There's test, no comp. Yeah, comp very important. Uh, compares instruction, compares two values. Uh, you call comp and then it should be a two opcode instruction. O2 SSDD. Uh, it does a subtract, but doesn't actually write the result back to the register. So why isn't that in the... Huh, it is here. I just missed it. I'm gone. Hmm. Comp B. So you call comp and then you call one of the uh, conditional branches. Error at line 50. Dean expected value got operator. Okay. That's probably finding this. Uh, that will be a flaw in the expression evaluator. Yeah, so it sees the closed parenthesis and it tries to uh, terminate the, um, it, it tries to find the matching parenthesis, but there isn't one. Um, I think I need to, right, if seeing value equals zero, return. So it now when it sees a that's not going to work. Uh, Expected value got operator. Right, it's actually seeing want value. I think 
I don't know what this is doing. Uh, okay, let's try to put some debugging in. <coughs> okay. Uh, so token 254 is 255, 254, it's a number. Then it's seen a 40, which is a at sign. Oh, hang on, this is a, this is a decimal, not hex. So 40 is a open parenthesis. Right, right, what's happened is it's read the two and it's looked at the next character and it's expecting it to be an operator or a known terminator character but an open parenthesis is not a known terminator character. So it's hit this. Now, so if seen value is not equal to zero, then it's expecting a expected value got operator That does seem to be the wrong message because I would expect it to be wanting a operator. But yeah, that was what made it work. So this, we've assembled and disassembled the thing and this looks more or less right. The numbers are all different because these are being interpreted as decimal. Clear, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Uh, can be any 1474, it's then expanded that because 1474 is out of range. 2R6, clear B, call the thing move a thing, likewise another expanded branch, add, swap, decrement, expanded branch. Okay, that looks promising. I think I have a thing that works. Uh, so we now have a working three-pass compiler, which is nice. It's, well, on my machine here, it is a whole 12K of code. Uh, it makes a 18 kilobyte x86 binary. Uh, I believe that should have built it, yep, that's built it for all the other Calgol architectures. So you can now assemble PDP-11 machine code on a BBC Micro, on CPM, on Z80 CPM, 12-ish-K, no. more once you apply the rounding. Uh, though we don't have the PDP-11 compiler actually working, so I can't show you what this is on a PDP-11. Not that I have a PDP-11. Or the three-phase power supply. But yeah, I think that is now done. 
I'm sure there are bugs. And, oops, and push it so I can't pretend I didn't do it. And it's done. Well, thank you very much, anyone who stayed with me through this. I hope this will actually be useful to me and possibly even to other people. It's good that I now have a... I've sorted out a lot of the problems involved in turning this into a three-pass compiler with expandable instructions and addressing modes. It'd be good to attack the Z80 at some point. Uh, it would be also nice to do like x86 assembly, but that's just so grim. What makes it worse is that if you look at the encoding, there is actually an underlying logic that dates back to the 8088, but it's been just so mangled as they added more and more instructions into the corners. It would also be good to factor out the stuff in common between this and the 8080 version. There's actually more than I thought like all the expression parsing and general tokenization. So that would make maintenance easier. But I'm going to do all that offline. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.